Welcome to Conversation with the Geographer. I'm Mike DeVivo, Professor of Geography at Grand Rapids Community College. And today we have Irene Nessa, who is a Professor of Geography at Orange Coast College. Irene, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Oh, it's certainly an honor and a privilege too, really. You've done so much for geography in California. And I, I'd like to ask you about um, reflecting upon your life, your childhood, and thinking about maybe experiences that sparked you to consider geography as a, as a career, as a, as a field of study. Sure. Um, my, my parents are both from Norway, and we would go there every summer when I was a kid. Um, you know, I learned Norwegian as a first language. I'm a first generation American born. And so um, I grew up understanding that there were different ways of doing things. And um, when, I, when I went to college, I was one of those people that changed their major every semester. Where did you go? I loved all my classes. I loved the sciences. I loved the humanities. I loved art. I loved all of it. And um, I happened to take a cultural geography class with Professor Claudia Lowe at Fullerton. Um, and I decided I wanted to be Claudia. What I loved about geography is that it explained why. You know, history does that, anthropology does that. There's a lot of disciplines that, that do that, but they have a, maybe a limited scope. And I love geography because we covered it all. So I could enjoy the sciences and the humanities and liberal arts. All we certainly examine the why of where better than any other discipline, that's for sure. So you were influenced as an undergraduate, for sure, and you decided you wanted to be a professor. And so from there you went to? So then I transferred to San Diego State as a junior into the geography department, and I had such fantastic faculty, mm -hmm. urban geography, um, and those are the, the two that really come to mind. So they were, again, so supportive, but so knowledgeable. And I feel like they really taught me to think spatially and see patterns and the interrelationships, but also how to interpret the landscape. And so I feel like that is really my background is um, landscape geography and landscape analysis. And, uh, and I owe a lot to them. And um, then I decided I would need to go to grad school. And um, so I was, I was encouraged to apply at San Diego State and, um, and got in and uh, yeah, studied uh, urban geography with Professor Larry Ford. Well, there are few better urban geographers in the history of our discipline, and there may be no one that walked in as many cities across the globe as Larry Ford had. I'm sure that when you went to meetings, you walked with him. Well, you know, we were so fortunate because even as an undergrad, he took his urban geography students, what he called lurking. We would meet in downtown San Diego, we would lurk, we would go on field excursions, um, and we would get to see what was what we were being taught, right, in the field. But then we would also make observations about things that were changing, right? So the landscape changes, and then the literature has to catch up, right? It, it, it's fantastic. And before he passed away, um, I was really fortunate to be able to visit with him and uh, we drove around San Diego and he showed me all the things that were new and happening and, um, and so forth. So all the way up until uh, he passed away, he was an urban geographer, absolutely. He was one of the more stellar, one of the most stellar geographers of the, of the past century for sure. And, and his uh, passing 
was a, was a great loss to our field. Um, he, he, he had done so much for our discipline. And uh, I'm sure that while you were lurking in San Diego, America's finest city, there was much that you learned just because the city changed so rapidly, really, over the course of the couple of decades that you studied there. I mean, you didn't study there for a couple of decades, but in the couple of decades that, that Larry was there, really. Oh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, um, and one of the things I think, um, well, I hope to do for my students is his fantastic ability to show slides. Mm -hmm. And incorporate that into the classroom and and take you on a virtual field trip, right? The old days with our thirty-five millimeter slides, um, and and he was always able to just end them and time them perfectly, and uh, and that was really a highlight of being his student. So I I hope to do that for my students too. He was also very kind. Yeah. And. Uh, uh, sparked encouragement in, in many ways. Certainly a, a, a geographer generous with his time and one that was an exemplary scholar. And, um, and you were fortunate to have studied with him. Oh, yeah, and, and Professor Frederick. Oh, wonderful person. Yeah, just like I said, it's extremely um, knowledgeable. I remember her slides in class where she's giving us the Latin names of all these plants. Did you, did you go into the field with her in the border region? I never did, mm. um, but I was her grad assistant for a while. And um, I helped to classify some of her research data that she did on um, Cascomatics mm. in Mexico. I mm -hmm. don't know whatever happened with that research, but I remember my job was to take all of her notes and then classify what they were made out of. Was it wattle and dog? Was it right? And what was their shape and so forth? Interesting, interesting. No, oh, well, you you certainly you certainly had um, gained a, a, a great benefit from the from the mentorship that you experienced. And so, from San Diego State, what did you do? Started doing part time gigs, mm -hmm. and, um, and I part timed all over Orange County and North San Diego County. And um, and you know when you're part time. You just have to say yes, right, to whatever the class is. And so even though my background was more urban geography, I ended up teaching a lot of physical geography and uh, physical geography labs, um, which was a lot of fun. And, um, and I realized that the, the underlying foundation for how we study the earth it really doesn't matter whether you're looking at skyscrapers or whether you're looking at tropical rainforests, right? That those skills transfer from, from one area of our discipline to another. And then um, I applied for a full-time position that came up at Orange Coast College and mm -hmm. I hired, um, geez, I think 20-something years ago now. Wow. So it's been 20 years at OCC. I've been part-time for a long time. You know, so I think, I think if it was today, I don't know that I would have been competitive enough to get the full-time job, but I think at that time, it was just this small cohort, perhaps, of people that were um, applying. That's what I, I think, I don't know, right? Um, but anyways, I've, I've been thrilled to be at, at Orange Coast College all these years, and, uh, excuse me, and, it's, it's just been fantastic it, to work with students and see those light bulbs go off when they decide that they have found their place in junk. And, and you've been able to note the different challenges that adjunct faculty and full-time faculty face. Full-time faculty have more administrative work and are tasked with also playing leadership roles, but adjunct faculty especially in Southern California must be freeway flyers. I don't know how much time many, how much time did you spend on the road when you were an adjunct? Oh my gosh, 
gosh, I think one semester I had taken on seven classes. Um, and what you try to do, and what we try to do when we schedule our part-time faculty, is you know you try to give up two classes back to back, right? So that they are just making one trip to your campus, and they're not coming there three days a week or so forth. Or you give them, you know, an afternoon class and a night class or something. Um, and so that was that was a really tough tough year. But you you know you said yes as long as you, you know you could do it right sure yes and then you're coming a half hour late right um and uh yeah and this is before right the online and the camera right the, right we, we did, everything was face to face it was all face to face and when i started teaching we were still using overhead projectors right, right. And the slide projectors right. We, we did everything was face to face slides. And um, chalkboards, whiteboards, right? So we hadn't made that switch to PowerPoint yet. And um, and I feel like when I did switch over, I I stopped doing so many slides. Mm -hmm. I stopped bringing in my carousel. Yes. And it took me a few years to realize I shouldn't have done that. Students love slides. Right? They love pictures. They love travel stories. That's what pulled me into geography. And not that hasn't changed. And so I reworked my PowerPoint and put those 35 millimeter slides back in, got them digitized um, so that we, I could still incorporate kind of that, that core of, of geography back into my instruction. Because I feel like I lost it when I first converted to power. That's, that's, that's interesting, and that's um, some sound counsel for, for those that might be viewing this, that have noticed that shift, and that, that and, and we should also realize that students do appreciate those visual images. Those visual images might assist them in uh, recalling a particular bit of information that some written narrative does not. Well, I think too, it's so easy these days to get information from other parts of the world, right? You can, you can get photos, you can get YouTube videos. And so maybe there's a tendency um, to not have your own personal experiences, right? Travel to expensive and so forth. But I think at its core, geography is still field experience, and and I know my students really appreciate at the end of the semester, they'll tell me, I like that you've been to these places. I like that these were your stories, right? And these were your photos. Then they, they appreciate that. I, I, this era where everything's available on the internet, so to have those personal experiences and share and and show these concepts, right, that we're talking about in class is, is still a, a core part of instruction, I think. I, I think. I think you're right. I think that providing those personal anecdotes, especially about uh, foreign area experiences, is highly valuable because it, it brings the students learning to another level. And they think, especially at the community college, they think, hey, Maybe I could do that someday. And they're inspired even more. Do you, have, have, you, have you taught any uh, field courses at OCC? No, I haven't um, taught them myself, but um, I am kind of proud to say we did develop the curriculum for a field course that became the model for our statewide transfer curriculum. Mm -hmm. And, um, so that class, it was a California field class. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Professor Chris Jones used to teach it for us. And they would go up this year in Nevada and then come down the coast. Um, and well, Chris is a good geographer. He really, we were so fortunate mm -hmm. willing to do that. Um, and, uh, but you know, we had to go through all of the administrative hoops mm -hmm. um, at the time. We had an administrator who didn't think that you could teach 
in a car, right? Or that the field was a classroom that you actually had to be in four walls. So, you know, it's a lot of um, educating other people on your campus about what you do and uh, making sure that the risk services understand that we're not going to end up with a lawsuit, right, and so forth. Um, but as a result of all of that work, not only are there field classes in geography now, but um, the geology department, ecology department, they were able to expand their field courses as well, and we're going to be working on doing some joint classes um, to the desert. That's great. That's great, and, and actually, this is this is an important uh, piece that is really filling a niche in the history of geography education in California. To know how this field experience as an imperative part of the curriculum came about, and it can be done in other parts of the U.S. with the right people in the right places engaging in the relationship building and the development of cogent arguments with administrative leaders saying this is what our discipline's about this is what we have to do you know yeah and then when we can make it interdisciplinary you know then that's like one more notch and then you've got to build up a, a cohort of students that are taking all of these field classes so now that um we're coming back from COVID, we're hoping to be able to offer these field courses again and, and build up that, that, um, field, that field group again. That, that, would be, that would be a wonderful thing. You're certainly in the right location, you know, taking, taking students really anywhere north, south, east, or Northeast, you can't go very far west. Well, you could go to the Channel Islands, I guess. Well, you know, it, it kind of just depends on how you write it up. So um, now we haven't done this, but my colleague at Irvine Valley, they take their students to Hawaii and they do um, volcanoes. Wow. And um, they go with the geology department. And um, so, yeah, we, we're really fortunate here in California. Um, the state changed the um, curriculum requirements so we can no longer repeat it. Mm -hmm. it be that you could have a field course and then students could take it four times, right? Um, but they said you can't do that anymore. And it affected, you know, performance and athletics and so mm -hmm. anybody that had that kind of repetition. So what we did instead is we've now made curriculum to specific places. So we have a desert field studies course, right? So now we can go to Death Valley, the Southwest, Zion. Um, you could do volcanoes, you, right? So we're doing specific environments that would allow students to take more than one field class, but also allow us to um, stay within the guidelines of the state. Well, that's great. Well, it's, it's legitimate and it's inherent to the uh, discipline, really. Uh, this, this, this matter of examining landscapes is very important and the best way to do it is to get your feet on the ground, you know? Well, and, and when we're thinking about growing our discipline, um, you know, it was, gosh, I don't remember how long ago it was, but Professor Steve Gray. Sure. Have a class, I believe, on how to be a geographer. So it's for their juniors and seniors, and they, they ask their transfer students, well, actually, anybody who was in that class, I think, they did a survey, and they asked them why they became a geography major. And there were three reasons, I'll never forget when he presented this, there were three main reasons that people became geography majors. So, number one, they love the field work, right? So, e even if it's not a field class, but you're going on a field trip on the weekend or lurking like we did with Larry, um, that, that draws people in. Um, but they also, they loved their, if they had a good instructor, 
right? So um, an instructor would be something that, or it's a way that they were pulled into the discipline. And then number three, they just love geography. And so field work and teaching, those are the keys for our discipline. I, I, I'm convinced, and, and, and Steve has done such good work you know, at, at Northridge, and he has attracted a, a tremendous following, and in in a variety from a variety of fields, from GIS to cultural geography, human geography. He's he's really he's he's really spearheaded a, a great effort there. Um, I'm going to ask you about courses that you've taught. Can you? Would, would you like to comment on some of the courses you've taught and uh, any memorable experiences associated with them? Sure. Um, so I've taught basically the whole breadth of lower division geography. So cultural, um, world, physical, physical geography lab. Um, even though my background is not physical geography, um, I did end up writing a custom lab manual for Orange Coast College um, where we kind of utilize our campus and we utilize our own resources for the lab activities and so forth. And, um, and I'm, I'm pretty proud of that manual. I think it's got a lot of great um, spatial analysis that students have to do instead of busy work um, that you find in, in a lot of manuals. Mm -hmm. um, and let's see, what else? With my cultural geography class, a number of, of years ago, I decided to change up my final project for them and have them do a poster just like we would do at a conference, right? With, with your abstract and methodology and literature re review and so forth. And the topic I chose was the geography of death. So where people die and why. And I know mm -hmm. it sounds really ominous and dark, but if we know where people are dying and we know why they're dying, isn't that gonna tell us something about conditions in that environment? Right? And so students could pick anything. They could pick natural disasters. They could pick war. They could pick disease. Um, and then I booked a facility on campus and we had a public poster session so that we invited administrators and students and so forth. Um, and it was, it's just been really fantastic because a lot of these students, right, they, they're nervous about presenting, right? And so telling them, listen, just make your poster. You've got to stand next to it, dress professional, answer questions. They really felt ownership of this research. And I would tell them, I said, listen, why am I the only one reading this great stuff you did? And so um, this has become kind of an annual event on our campus, the Geography of Death poster session. Really? Yes, and some of our students go on to CGS mm -hmm. there, um, and uh, but ultimately they get really good experience, not just doing research, but putting it together and then presenting it. And and they and and you've reached out to the public and members of the public come to see their posters as well. Um, I don't know that we we do reach out to the public. I don't know how many people from the public come. But we do get board members that come. We get administrators that come, you know, because they're supporting students. We also sure. get food, right? So no eat, no meat, right? So you got to have some cookies and coffee and so forth. And um, students come in, you know, professors give extra credit for attending. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's really been a fun event to, to organize. And then most recently, with my world regional class, I decided that I needed to talk about the poles as a standalone region, right? So if you think about all of our world regional texts, the poles are covered with Russia and Canada, right? They're not really covered as their own standalone chapter. And so since we moved online to Canvas, I created a module for poles and um, I have students map polar um, landforms on a polar projection so that, again, you're not just 
looking at the fringes of land masses, but you're looking at mm -hmm. from the polar perspective. And they map Antarctica and some of the research stations and so forth. And um, created lectures on the differences between the Arctic and the Antarctic, right? Because they're two really mm -hmm. Um, talking about some of the issues related to global warming and um, students really responded really positively to that because none of them had been exposed to the poles that way and I think with climate change and global warming it's really important that we look at the world from a polar perspective as opposed to you know just as an aside mm -hmm. Well, I, 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 um, I hope that there are authors of a word, world regional text that will listen to this interview and maybe incorporate the poles as a separate chapter, as a separate region. Um, yeah, I think it absolutely needs to be standalone these days. You know, you, you, a moment ago you mentioned the CGS, and I'd like you to... Um, please reflect on the CGS, the California Geographical Society. It was at the uh, conference in San Diego 22 years ago that I first met you. And wow. Um, anyway, and, um, and I guess I'd like you to comment on, on why you believe it's important, because I know you believe it's important. <laughs> I can't even begin to say how fantastic the California Geographical Society is. Um, I was encouraged to go and present as a student when I was at San Diego State, and I did. And um, I won the, the prize for graduate student paper presentation. And my friend Sophia won for posters. And that was the year Barbara Frederick won Outstanding Educator. <laughs> Uh, it was a really fun San Diego State suite, but what what I love so much about the CGS is how student friendly it is. Uh, it's a wonderful place for young geographers to have that opportunity to present their work. Um, I love bringing my students to the CGS. Um, I was lucky to be elected as a board member for a while. And um, I just, like I said, I can't say enough about this organization. Um, I love that they're constantly trying to find new ways to improve things and um, to get more students involved and so forth. And frankly, I think the student presentations are better in many cases than the faculty, right? I mean, there's just some great stuff going on in California geography. So it's a wonderful place to network. Also, the CGS has really been instrumental in California geography um, addressing things that come out of the state legislature. I'm sure that other states are like this too, where legislators also believe that they're educators, right? And so um, one of the things that we're working on currently in California is something called guided pathways, right? Where there's going to be a pathway that students choose. And for geography, we straddle the sciences and the social sciences, right? We straddle. So we can fit into more than one pathway. And there were some campuses where geography faculty were being told, no, you have to pick. And so, at um, our last in-person conference at Big Bear, this came up, and um, on Friday it was a talking point. On Saturday they had written a resolution, and Saturday night all of the former presidents signed it, um, and we were able to take these this resolution back to our campuses, to our guided pathways committees, and say, "Listen, here's the state organization." We fit both categories. There you go. And it was a lot of great support for faculty that were on campuses that, that were having trouble with this. Um, and so that's one example of how CGS, it, it's not just about the presenting and the research, but also supporting faculty um, in our institutions, right, as we advocate for geography in these um, 
directives that come from the state. I, I, I can see that. And I know that, you know, when I've, I've been to your presentations at the CGS, ranging from the geography of the Frozen film to uh, working on um, outcomes in education. And I'll, I'll ask you, uh, as we uh, begin our conclusion of this interview, I'll ask you to think about the work you've done, the places you've been, the institutions you've served. And I'll ask you to um, reflect upon experiences you've had and to make a few comments that could offer uh, guidelines, perhaps, or words of advice for prospective community college faculty and perhaps even colleagues in the discipline as the discipline is now undergoing changes. Do you have any final thoughts or words that you'd like to share? Well, Mike, that's a good question, and I don't know that you've got enough time for all of my advice. Um, here, I will give it a few minutes. Knock, knock yourself out. For <laughs> um, let's see here. First of all, what I always tell, in fact, I just had this conversation with one of my part-timers who's new, um, which is passion is contagious. Passion's contagious. Whatever you're passionate about, right, whatever it is that you're studying, and if it's the Frozen movies because you've got a <laughs> um, whatever it is, be passionate, right? If you're studying the geography of ants, be passionate about it because it's contagious. And passion also shows value. You're communicating that what you're studying and what you're teaching matters, right? That it, it matters. So be passionate and don't be don't be um, shy about letting your geography freak flag fly. Just let it fly, right? Um, also, when you're starting out, make sure that you get a good foundation of your content. I know that like you want to try all these new things and all these ideas, right, that, that are great and fantastic, but um, you need the mashed potatoes right before you put on the gravy and the bacon bits. So make sure that you've got a solid foundation of content and then build on it and then add the gravy and the dill, right? Whatever you're gonna put on there. But don't start with the gravy, right? Because then you can get bogged down. So that was an, another piece of advice. Mm -hmm. we have. Um, let's see, if you are wanting to go into community college teaching, um, put yourself in every single geography pool that you can find, right? Um, say yes to things, contact the department chairs, offer to do a guest lecture. This is where I find a lot of um, good part-time faculty is through um, CGS presentations mm -hmm. and other local presentations, and, and I'll ask people to come guest lecture in my course. Um, this helps you to establish experience, but it also helps you with your networking. Um, don't take on too much. I think I mentioned one time I had seven classes. That was insane. Don't do it. Right? <laughs> stick, stick to what you can manage. Because if you are getting over, um, if you're getting stretched too thin, it's going to show up in your instruction and it's gonna show up with your students. And um, you don't want a negative, bad reputation, right? Um, that's hard to overcome. So make sure that you don't over um, commit. Um, and I don't know, I think that those are I guess things. Well. Also, travel, if you, I know travel is expensive and it's hard. Um, but students really appreciate when you've gone and you've been somewhere yourself. Um, we have a lot of content to cover. We can't, we can't cover all of it in a semester. That's okay. Just embrace that. Cover what you are most confident about 
and what you are most passionate about, and that is going to be contagious. No matter what, you're the expert, right? You know more than the students do. Mm -hmm. That's th those are wonderful pieces of advice. And yes, travel, explore the world, and engage in that analysis of landscapes. You know, Irene, I, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. It's, it's, it's been wonderful. I really appreciate you taking the time to, to visit with us today. So this concludes. You're, you're very welcome. It's an honor and a privilege. This concludes our uh, conversation with the geographer episode today. Thank you.